Hey everyone, welcome once again to the Winning Digital Customers Show. I'm Howard Tierski. Today, let's talk about books. You know, I love books. I would say I probably consume about two books a week, so that's hundred, many hundreds, maybe th maybe more than a thousand books in my lifetime. I'm not sure. And I also love printed books. Here's my book, Winning Digital Customers. And you know, if I have my druthers as to whether you should get the ebook version or the printed version as the author, I'd rather have you have the printed version. I know you're going to see it in color. I know it's going to be a physical object in your world that's going to remind you, hey, I, I bought this book. I should read this book, right? So I am a fan of physical books. And yet I'm here today to talk about two interrelated topics. The first is a prediction that I think that physical books are going away. They're not going away tomorrow, but over the next 10 years, my prediction is that we will see a dramatic diminishing of physical books in favor of electronic books. And I'm going to give you an overwhelming argument in today's live cast as to why that is going to be true. And I welcome your thoughts, your disagreements in the comments. That is totally fine. But I think if you listen to this whole uh, reasoning, I believe you're going to agree with me that the printed book is going away. But as I said, it's two interrelated topics. So it's not really just about books I want to talk about today, but I want to use books as a proxy for something that we all need to be thinking about in our businesses all the time, which is what is it? What is something that we're used to, but that frankly is probably not going to be, uh, is something that's probably not going to be uh, at the core of our business or a main part of our value proposition in, in the future, possibly in the near future. So that's what I want to think about today. And uh, let us um, let us dive in. Is my audio okay? Let me know if it's not. I heard a funny thing. Okay, so first of all, uh, let's just look at the growth of eBooks because obviously the truth is we have two competitors, so to speak, to the traditional printed book. If you think about the traditional printed book in paperback and hardcover formats, uh, you have two primary digital competitors. One is the eBook, and of which, of course, there are several competing varieties, and the other is the audiobook, the digitally delivered audiobook. Now, if we look at the growth of eBooks over the last, uh, what is this, about the last eight or not, eight, uh, five, six years, you can see 93% growth in eBook consumption uh, up to what is now a $29 billion market just in the United States for eBooks. So very substantial growth. And of course, you can see that big bump up in 2020, the digital acceleration that happened as a result of COVID further pushed the consumption of eBooks forward. So that's a very impressive growth. But that is still, in this, these numbers are just eBooks, not audiobooks. But that is still only 15% of all books sold in the United States. So despite the growth, eBooks have definitely not taken over for physical books in the United States yet. And if we add in audiobooks, that's another 11% of the market. So you're talking about a total of 26% of the market, a little bit more than a quarter, which is some sort of digital consumption. And the other 75% is still on paper. So you might say to yourself, Howard, you really don't have the numbers to support the argument that eBooks are going to dominate in the future. Why would you say that? I'll tell you why I'd say that because I've lived through the growth of the internet. There was a time when internet advertising was only a small portion. There was a time when e-commerce was a much, much smaller portion. There was a time when almost everything which is dominant in the digital world today started out as 1% and then it grew to 25%. And of course, it continued to grow to become dominant. Now that's not guaranteed to happen in every domain, of course, but that's what I predict for eBooks. And I'm going to give you a very specific reason, and it has nothing to do with books. It is a general principle, which you can apply to almost anything that you're trying to think about and understand for the future and say, what direction is, is this going? And it's a model of pain and pleasure. But first, I just want to take a moment and just remind ourselves that the idea of shifting consumption of the written word 
is not a new idea. You know, the original written word was carved into blocks of granite or other kinds of stone, right? Hammurabi's uh, uh, tablets and the Ten Commandments, right? And then we moved on to scrolls, a new technology in whenever that was, 2000 BC or what have you, right? And so uh, people started to write with, with, with uh, you know, papyrus using a natural inks on quills to try to find a more portable, uh, easier to produce, a uh, more reproducible form than the extremely inconvenient and heavy and definitely not portable and very slow method of documenting things in stone tablets. So scrolls were the iPhone of the time or the Kindle of the time in uh, you know 2000 BC. And then of course we moved to books and books went through several versions, but ultimately you know the, the modern book uh, printed through a printing press uh, of course, famously, uh, the Gutenberg Bible being one of the early books that were printed, massive cultural revolution as a result of the widespread availability of the printed book. So we owe a lot to this form factor, the bound, the folio that gets printed in large sheets, it gets folded, it gets cut down, it gets bound with some kind of glue or other binding. This format we've had for hundreds and hundreds of years, and it has served us well, but it is only one step in an evolution of the distribution of the printed word, and there will be more steps. And I think it's safe to say, and you're gonna hear me further this argument in the next few minutes as to why the ebook in its various forms of consumption, and I'm gonna include uh, audio books, digital audio books, sort of as part of that same story, the, the consumption, the digital consumption of written content, particularly book length written content, uh, as opposed to, um, being consumed on paper. So there's an interesting history, which I just want to tell you a little bit about, about the idea of the electronic book. The idea of the electronic book is not new. It was not invented by Amazon. In fact, it was initially postulated by someone named Bob Brown in the 1930s. And he went and saw the first talkie movie. You know, talkies, right? When early silent films, someone in the theater would play the piano like in those old fantastic Charlie Chaplin films. And if they, you needed to know the dialogue, they'd put it up on screen like a slide, right? That was the early uh, cinema. And then all of a sudden, they developed the technology to synchronize sound, not just through a piano player, but to have a soundtrack that was on the film itself. And you had uh, films like the first talkie movie, the Al Jolson's uh, movie, The Jazz Singer. And of course, it led to a complete transformation of the way stories could be told through cinema. And then obviously that leads to television and other things. Um, so when Bob Brown went to see his first talkie movie, he had the insight that now that movies could talk, something similar needs to happen with the book. We need some method of being able to have books speak to us. And as long as we're gonna have some kind of electric gadget, of course, this was before you know the computer era, it should also allow you to do things like adjust the type size. So the idea of some sort of device that shows you the book, allows you to control the experience, adjust the type size, and also allows you, that book to be read to you was introduced almost 100 years ago, obviously at a time when the technology did not exist to support it. And but an interesting insight, because so often the ideas that drive our, uh, our world forward are not a new idea, but a pre-existing idea, perhaps an idea, for example, from science fiction, that the technology had not caught up to the thinking. Sometimes we have a new technology and we say, what can we do with it? But sometimes we have an idea and we can't implement it until a certain level of technology maturity and all of a sudden things become possible. And that certainly has happened recently based uh, to make real Bob Brown's vision of the ebook and no doubt more. Um, you know, in the we then had in the 1960s the very what are believed to be the very first examples of electronic books, and they were uh, and I did a whole uh, live cast on this a few weeks ago about how the U.S. military has often been a force to drive technology forward in a way that then benefits the commercial world. Of course, they invented the internet, or or or, or, or at least majorly funded the internet, the microprocessor, the laser, uh, and on and on and on. And that is also true of the electronic book. The best earliest known example, or at least the earliest one that's known to me, is from the 60s when the US Department of Defense created what was called the Personal Electronic Aid to Maintenance. It was essentially 
maintenance manuals for various military things, I'm guessing tanks or missiles or whatever else. And of course, the military could afford uh, the high cost of being one of the first ones to create something like this. And you can see a little picture of it there inset. And you could even see that it had a, an audio component as well. So this was early work, but no doubt very expensive, probably clunky and had other problems, uh, but early innovations in eBooks. Um, fast forward to 1993, the launch of Microsoft Encarta, a CD-ROM based encyclopedia. You know, I remember um, when I was born in 1968, the first thing my parents did, or well, maybe not the first thing, but one of the first things was to go out and buy a set of the World Book Encyclopedia. And they still have in their house in Lincolnwood, Illinois, that same World Book Encyclopedia set from 1968. It's, uh, it's, quite, um, uh, it's quite entertaining. In fact, it was a while back, but I remember opening it up and looking up the definition of computer back from the year 1968. And the, the encyclopedia says, uh, has a whole article about computers and, of course, pictures of people with pocket protectors standing next to giant computers with those reels of tape and lots of lights lighting up on them like in an old bank computer from the 60s and pictures might have even have been from the 50s who knows and there was a, an article and it talked about computers and at the end of the article I remember it said computers are getting smaller and smaller all the time one day there will be a computer small enough to fit in a single room <laughs> needless to say that reflects the lack of ability to imagine the way in which the future will be different from the present and clearly, um, I think part of what I'm trying to communicate to you today as well is I think that in the book arena as well, uh, we, we, uh, we are well served by putting our imaginations into what would a world look like if the trends that we see today extend far beyond where we imagine initially that they might. So in any way, in 1993, Microsoft created the Encarta CD-ROM based encyclopedia, ran for, uh, I think about 10 years they made that. Uh, it was moderately successful, but it certainly... In, in, it certainly um, suggested that it, there were much better ways to get access to information about the world than via an encyclopedia set. And while books are still around today, I point this specific example out to you to show you that and say encyclopedias are not, right? Between Wikipedia and other tools, we have completely supplanted that application of the book I don't know that you can even buy a set of encyclopedias today. And if you can, I, I can only imagine it's only for nostalgic purposes. And so um, I think that is an early example of a book category being completely eliminated in favor of digital. And again, I'm going to talk more about why I think we're going to see that proliferate. But in any case, moving forward through our quick tour of the history of eBooks, in 1997, you had a product called Rocketbook. And over the next 10 years, you had another number of companies. Sony came out with their series of eBook readers. And of course, it really took off in 2007 when Amazon came out with the Kindle because just like when Apple came out with the iPhone or the iPod rather, there were pre-existing music MP3 players prior to Apple's iPod and there were pre-existing ebook readers. But when Amazon brought together the hardware and the content and they had a massive library of books and an easy commerce platform where you could buy books and put them on the device, that combination combined with the fact that the technology had advanced to the point where the reading experience was good, the battery life was good. In 2007, it's hard to believe, it was already 14 years ago, uh, the first ebook readers became popular. And of course, now, not only do you have Kindle ebook readers, you have competing readers like the Nook or, or Kobo Reader, but in addition, ebook software on so many of the mobile devices that we have means that you can buy a book and access it on a dedicated e-reader or on your iPhone or on your Android phone or on your tablet or on probably just about any device that you would want to access it on. You probably wouldn't want to access it on your TV. Um, and so that uh, capability is now, uh, you know, essentially the modern uh, suite of uh, digital eBooks that are available. So that's a little bit of the history. And as I said, my prediction is that this is the future. The form factor of the eBook may change, of course. The technology will continue to improve. But again, my prediction is that by 10 years from now, the, e the physical book will be massively minimized in favor of the digital book. It won't totally go away. My son, for example, still has, a, in, a couple years ago, purchased a, a, a record player. I couldn't believe it when he wanted one, but there's a, there's a beautiful nostalgia to being able to play an LP record. Uh, and so, and some people like certain aspects of the sound of the vinyl 
And so he has that and he plays records and he has a small collection of records. But is it the main way he listens to music? No. Is it dominant in the music industry? No. It is a, a, a marginalized media and that is what or a way to access extremely old music which hasn't been updated to the new things and this is what i would say we're going to see it's going to go the way of the, the lp and the vhs tape for most applications why why do i think that this trend which has got us up right now to digital formats being 25 percent of the industry is going to go to whatever number 85 percent 90 percent enough that the remaining print market will be marginalized. Well, any new innovation has an adoption curve based on two things, pain and resistance. In other words, new innovations that solve pre-existing points of pain are desirable. The iPhone enabled you to you know, access all kinds of content and information and communications that previously you had to open up your laptop or you had to find a find a, a, you know, an ethernet port or dial up on a modem to access. It solved a lot of pre-existing points of pain. And that is why the smartphone has become such a popular innovation. And of course, once something becomes popular, more people, it's, it becomes a positive spiral, right? More R&D goes into it, more innovation, more applications, and it only becomes more and more and more valuable such that today, the pain of not having an iPhone in your pocket or whatever device you use would be so great that some people will, if you get you know, 20 minutes to work, and you're only 30 minute drive and you realize you've left your phone in the, in the, on your nightstand, how likely is, is, is it that you'll turn around and drive home again and drive back to work again, rather than go all day without your phone. For many people, they would say they're going to head back home if they, if it's humanly possible, because the feeling of, I've heard people say the feeling of not having your phone, it's like having a limb cut off throughout the day. No, uh, you know, no, no insult meant to people who actually have lost a limb. I'm sure it's actually much worse, but that's the emotional metaphor that people use when they talk about how important that device is to them. So that's because it solved pre-existing points of pain. And what I want to do with the remainder of my time today is give you my argument as to why I believe eBooks are so overwhelmingly in the pain solving business that they will take over the marketplace. And I also encourage you to think about these examples in the context of whatever industry you're in. If you're not in the book industry, what is the analog in your industry? And are you really cognizant of all the areas of pain you're creating for your customers. A lot of what I talk about in my book, Winning Digital Customers, and a lot of the work that I do at my company is helping companies study and understand their customers and really understand what are all the points of friction, what are all the points of extra effort, pain, disappointment, uh, whatever words you want to use, because those are the opportunities to create a new experience that differentiates and create customer love. Or if someone else creates, solves those problems, those are the opportunities to become irrelevant if someone else has a better offer. But there's another side to that coin, and we're going to talk about that too, which is resistance. Not everything which is new and improved in some way is adopted because people do get set in their ways. They become habituated. We have certain behaviors that we're used to. If you're someone who uses a regular toothbrush, someone might, your dentist might tell you how an electric toothbrush will be good for your gums. But you know, you're kind of used to your regular toothbrush, and you may not want to make that change unless there's enough reason to. So we have to know that there's always gonna be that friction of adopting a new innovation. And clearly today, not everybody has decided that they wanna adopt eBooks. And some people take more time than others. You know, The ATM or other major innovations took sometimes decades to transition. And as I mentioned earlier, eBook has been transitioning for decades and particularly in the last decade, it's gotten up to 25%. And here's why I think that that, that balance uh, between solving points of pain and resistance is going to completely tilt if we're just patient enough in the next number of years, completely toward in favor of digital delivery. So first of all, so one of the challenges of books, and it's very similar to the classic Steve Jobs, a thousand songs in your pocket argument for an iPhone or an iPod, I should say, is that you can take your entire library with you wherever you go. The devices such as a Kindle can hold hundreds or even thousands of books, but also if they're cloud connected, they can access ebooks. So you have access to that library, your library of books, every book you've ever bought, you know, wherever you go all the time at any time, you can never really lose a book. Everything is always accessible to you all the time, you know, compared to the pain of having your house with bookcases everywhere filled with books, trying to find a book or 
going on a vacation. I remember going on a cruise 15 years ago and trying to decide which books I was, was I going to bring with me? Cause I was going to bring a whole suitcase full of books, but I kind of wanted selection, you know? And I also knew I would have a lot of time to read all those points of pain are gone with electronic books. And of course the form factor is extremely convenient. You can't put a book in your pocket. Even a paperback is pretty hard to put in your pocket unless you have enormous pockets. Certainly can't put multiple of them and you can read a book uh, an ebook on a wide range of devices, all the way down to the one that you carry with you every day. So even if you don't remember to bring a book with you, you've already always got not only a book, but a whole library with you wherever you go. And of course, as you're reading that book, you can synchronize that across multiple platforms. So if you're reading on your phone, you can switch to reading that. It will remember what page you're on when you go to another device. Also, the content is available on demand. So even aside from what I said earlier about access to your entire collection of books, when you want a new book or you want to find a book on a particular topic, you can, of course, you don't have to worry about figuring out what the book is, going to the library, going to Barnes & Noble, asking for, for help, buying a physical book, uh, finding out they don't have it in stock, going somewhere else. You know, uh, you don't have to worry about if you, there's a, con a, a book that's published, but it's not in your country uh, you know, how will you get a copy of it from the United States if you're in Australia? All of those problems are eliminated. You can search across every book that's available, click a button and be reading that book seconds later. So the convenience of on-demand purchase and immediate gratification of reading a new book is enormous and overcomes points of pain. One that's important for me because I like to read books on vacation is that many e-readers are waterproof. The one that I use from Amazon, I take in the hot tub with me. Little thing can literally be submerged underwater. And of course, more and more of our other devices like our phones are becoming more waterproof. I can't tell you how many books in my life I've been reading in some outdoor location or somehow they got left in the rain or otherwise uh, you know, damaged or ruined. You can search across a book. Using a book index, I'm sorry, that is a terrible experience. Have you had this experience? You go look up the thing in the back and the little fine print, and then it'll say, here's the topic you want. And it's on page two and page 11 and page 27 and page 93 and page 127 to 130. And now you got to kind of keep the finger in the index page and now go back and forth. And I mean, this is not a great user experience at all. The ability to simply search within the text of a book and find what you're looking for. And by the way, not everything's in the index of a book anyway. So searching eBooks is a huge benefit. Also, integrated dictionaries. Many ebooks allow you to tap on any word and find out what it means. That's great if you're reading a book that uses big words or if you're reading a book in another language and you don't necessarily have the full vocabulary that the book has. So the ability to annotate as well, not just to look up words, but have footnotes that are immediately viewable by tapping on the footnote instead of having to find them in the back of the book. More points of pain of reading a traditional book. And we might not have thought about them as pain. You know, sometimes you accept. In my book, I talk about two types of pain. Blame pain and accepted pain. Blame pain is you're like, why is it like this? Accepted pain is the effort or friction that you just deal with because, well, that's how a book is. That's how an index is. I'm not going to complain about it. That's just what it takes if you want to look something up in a book. But then a new innovation comes along like eBooks and no, it doesn't have to be that way. There's a better way to do that. And so that's why I say it's important that you're always thinking about within your own products and services, what are the things that your customer might be accepting but if you could fix them, you would create new delight. Amazon created a retail store chain now called Amazon Go, where there's no checkout. You pick up what you want. On the way in, you scan your phone and, on your, and it watches you, but with cameras and artificial intelligence, it knows what products you've grabbed. You've probably heard of this store. And then when you're done, just leave. You don't have to worry about standing in line and going through a checkout process. Most customers, as long as the line wasn't too long, they didn't feel like checking out when you bought something in a store was an unreasonable thing. They weren't mad about it. They didn't blame anybody. But all of a sudden, when you don't have to do it anymore, it feels transformational. Um, a few more things. I'm trying to give you an overwhelming number of demonstrations of how eBooks are solving pre-existing pain with traditional books. If you want to take notes on a book that you're reading, you have two choices. Choice number one, ruin the book by writing in it. And choice number two is to... Uh, Use a separate piece of paper you know, or a separate notebook, take the notes there, write down the page numbers, and now you've got to cross-reference these things. With eBooks, you can highlight anything you want. You can type the note right in there, and then you can search the notes that you take. In addition to that, you can change the type size. Now, depending on your age when you're listening to this, <laughs> that may or may not feel transformational. But I can tell you that somebody who's in my 50s, if I want to read a book, I need these. 
And obviously there are people with vision far worse than mine that wouldn't even be able to read a book without uh, a large magnifying glass or a specialized large print edition of the book. And of course, while that has existed for some number of decades, the number of books that large print editions are provided for is very, very small. So uh, the electronic book format allows you to easily adjust the size of the type to whatever you're comfortable with. Another point of pain, can I read this book? Can I read this type size solved? Ebooks are often less expensive, which is fantastic. Another point of pain solved. Ebooks don't get ruined. They don't get damaged. They don't have to be replaced if you read them too many times. And furthermore, one of the classic points of pain of book publishing is that it's slow. How long does it take from the time an author has finished writing the manuscript to when that book can be purchased in a store? Having been a book author myself, I can tell you that for the traditional book publishing industry, the answer to that is very often one year. Now, there are ways to accelerate that. You could probably get that down to a few months rather than uh, a year. And with on-demand printing, to be fair, you could get it even shorter. But if you think about the primary way that books are sold today, which is not on demand, which is typically more expensive, but is with printing presses, it's many, many months to get from the completed manuscript to a book which you can buy in the bookstore between the printing, creating the plates, the printing, the, the, the cutting, the binding, the gluing, the drying, the, the packing it up, the shipping it to the distribution center, getting it from the distribution center to the bookstore, getting the bookstore to put on the shelves. You can see how there's many, many steps. With ebooks that can be streamlined so that an author can create something and essentially with a little bit of formatting work, which can often be done in a couple of days, depending on the complexity of the book, get that book out on Amazon. Now that's not relevant for every kind of book, but when you think about books that have anything to do with current events or our technology world, which is changing so fast, the ability to get books out more rapidly in the ebook format is essential. And by the way, a related topic is in the traditional publishing industry, you have gatekeepers. You kind of need a publishing company if you're going to do a big print book release because you have to print a large number of books because that's how printing presses work. And so it's difficult to do that as an independent author. There has been for many years uh, an industry of that, but it's been very small. All of a sudden, with the uh, availability of Kindles and other e-readers and platforms like KDP on Amazon, uh, independent book authoring has shot through the roof. And now all of a sudden you have 10 times more books for you to choose from new books I'm referring to because more publishers, don't, they don't have to go through a gatekeeper. It's not a small percentage of aspiring authors. Of course, there's a downside. There could be a lot of junk out there. But if there's a book you want on the niche topic, even if it's not perfectly proofread, you're probably glad that it's out there. Um, by the way, one of the challenges of the book publishing industry for years has been it's, been it's very tough to make money in the book publishing industry because of all those steps that I talked about. The retailer wants a piece. The distributor wants a piece. The author wants a piece. And as a result, book publishing has not for many years been a wildly profitable enterprise. The opportunity for publishers to make a lot more money by cutting out a lot of these unnecessary steps, by having a much more efficient way to get the written word from the author's you know, computer, their word processor, whatnot, to the eyeballs of the reader means that there's much more opportunity for profit in publishing. And by the way, traditional books are also not the most environmental thing in the world. I'll grant you there are worse things for the environment, like cars, but nevertheless, we top down a lot of forests, we kill a lot of trees for printing books, and not only that, the printing takes energy, the inks are not environmentally friendly for the most part, they go on trucks, you have a carbon footprint to get the books where they need to go, so all you have to drive to the store to get the books, all of these things are not nearly as environmental as a purely digital file, which is sent to an email. Now, I believe, I hope, I've made a compelling case for a crazy number of ways that eBooks are better at solving the pain or are great ways to solve many, many points of pain. I think I listed more than a dozen we have in traditional books. Some people might say, well, wait a minute. There are downsides to eBooks. So those might all be benefits, but what about the downsides? And again, I think this is the process you need to think about in your own business. If you think about innovating, if you think about changing the game, the way eBooks are. Well, let's look at some. First of all, one of the things people say is, oh, but I love to browse the stacks of Barnes and Noble or other bookstores and read. I can just go to a bookstore and I can read and check the books out and see whether the books I want to buy. That now is solved on ebook platforms because you can generally download the first chapter or two for free. And then if you want to just push one button, pay the fee and get the rest of the book. What about libraries? Books are so important in libraries. I want to go. I don't want to have to always buy a book. I want to be able to check books out from the library. The infrastructure for e 
free uh, lending of eBooks from libraries has been growing and growing and growing. In fact, during COVID, most libraries shut down everything because they couldn't provide in-person services except their eBook lending. And so in many, many cases now, you can borrow an eBook from your local library the same way you would have borrowed a physical book, or maybe not the same way. You're not gonna go to the library and wait in line and, and have them scan it with a little infrared barcode reader, right? You're gonna do it electronically in a much easier way but you can still get access to a large percentage of eBooks through interlibrary lending. What about sharing a book with a friend? I'd like to share a book with a friend and just give it to them. You can do that with eBooks as well, by and large. You can transfer temporarily an eBook to a friend and get it back, in most cases, with no fee. Um, one of the challenges of eBooks initially was, you know, older books weren't available. You could read the latest new release, perhaps, but if you wanted something from 20 years ago before eBooks were popular, that wasn't available. That has been heavily adjusted. In fact, I would say that's been turned on its head. There was a time when there were books that you can get in print and you could not get them electronically. Today, while of course, I'm sure you could probably find an example of a publisher or an author that hasn't bothered to create an electronic book, the vast, vast, vast majority of not only all new releases are available, but back catalog books that are only that were printed and are still available in print before uh, ebooks have now been digitized and are available on eBooks. And even better, books that aren't even in print anymore, books that you actually couldn't easily get your hands on a physical printed copy are, have in many cases been digitized and are available. And by the way, some that are old in our public domain are available for free. So the catalog of books that is available for eBooks is far, far broader than the catalog of books that is available in print, not the other way. So when we weigh this out, huge number of benefits and most of the downsides of eBooks have been mitigated at this point. So what's left? Why is anybody, why are 75% of people still reading books the old fashioned way? Well, people love books, right? <laughs> people have an emotional attachment to books. People have grown up reading books. And I think that this emotional attachment is the resistance. This is the form of resistance that we talked about earlier, right? Overcoming pain, but you have resistance. And often resistance is emotional, which is another way of kind of saying irrational, right? I don't mean to discount it, but there's an overwhelming number of reasons. But, you know, and then it's also just a habit. Like I said about the toothbrush earlier, when people are used to doing something one way, they're not always immediate to switch to a new way. Some people are like, I kind of like sending a, a letter to somebody. Why should I use email? I kind of like going to the teller. Why should I use an ATM? And there'll always be a holdout, right? Jeffrey Moore's innovation curve showing there's always going to be laggards. Maybe there's somebody out there that is still, uh, you know, chiseling stuff on a stone tablet or writing things on a scroll, right? There's always somebody, but we're talking about mainstream here. And I think the reality is that nostalgia is a beautiful thing. There are some people who still like to write on an IBM Selectric typewriter. There are some people who still like to watch TV on an old CRT tube, as I mentioned earlier. There's some people who, who like to uh, listen to vinyl records, but this is a small niche. And so I think what we're gonna find is that this trend is gonna continue. This line is gonna continue up. More and more people, you know, all, if you look at all those reasons why eBooks are better, some of them are gonna be more important to you and some of them are gonna be less important to you. Maybe you say, Howard, I never read books in the, in the hot tub. I don't care if they're waterproof. That's not a problem I have. I have great vision. I don't care about the type size, that's fine. You don't need to care about all of them. Honestly, all you need is one of them <laughs> that's going to make a difference for you, right? If all of a sudden you get really interested in stamp collecting and you discover that all the great classic books on stamp collecting were written in the 1920s and 1930s in the golden era of stamp collecting and they're only available as eBooks, I bet you all of a sudden you become an eBook user. And once you start using it for some books, I'm guessing you're going to wind up moving this is a slippery slope till you get to the point where you want to buy all your new books that way, or at least a lot of them. And so I think what we're going to find is that that emotional force of nostalgia and, and, and habit uh, is just not strong enough to stand back against the tide of the massive number of benefits of eBooks. And you could say the same about many other aspects of our world today. And, and also, I would say many things that involve paper. You know, I remember in the 90s, we talked about the paperless office and for a while, we started creating a lot of digital stuff, but also printing it, printing it all out. And there were times when people were saying, you know, the paperless office is not as was a myth, because even with all of the digital stuff, we're still putting we're still putting a lot of stuff on paper. But that was a long time ago. And now, clearly, while no office is completely paperless, 
you know, they're not building offices anymore with hundreds and hundreds of file cabinets to store all of our, our paper, paper files, right? Most things today are electronic. And I think we're going to find that that is going to be true of books and perhaps other things as well. I would argue in the next 10 years, some other things that are likely to go away, forms, any kind of printed written form of any sort, business cards. I just ordered myself an electronic business card, which is like a metal, it's metal, it's almost like a credit card and it has an NFC chip, your field communications chip, so I can give someone my contact information without handing them a piece of paper. And I would argue, and I mentioned this in an earlier live cast, even cash. What do we need paper cash for anymore? So now you're like, okay, you've just totally undermined what you said about books. You almost had me on the books, but cash, come on, man. We're not getting rid of dollar bills. We'll see, we'll see. Maybe this will be on YouTube 10 years from now and someone will point to it as a prescient commentary or the opposite. They'll say, clearly this guy didn't know what he was doing. It's like the Jetsons. There's no flying cars and pneumatic tubes to get us to work. So I can't promise you that my predictions are accurate, but what I've tried to do is give you my reasons and also I'll encourage you to use similar thinking in the areas of your own business because a long range scenario vision of what might be, how your industry might change in the coming years or decade can be very valuable in thinking about what steps you might want to take now to prepare for that world. And what's the worst that happens? I'm wrong on my timing. It's not 10 years, it's 15 years or it's 20 years. If you're still heading in the direction of the future, you're heading the right way. Or what if I'm totally wrong? Well, good Lord, don't put all your chips in this basket. I'm not saying stop printing books today. I'm just saying be preparing and thinking for this as a likely, but not absolutely certain possible future scenario. So Hopefully that was useful to you guys. Interesting. It was interesting to me to kind of look into this topic and, and put my thoughts together about it. As always, I really appreciate your listening and watching the Winning Digital Customer Show. And until next time, keep transforming. Mm -hmm.